Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has escaped the hustle and bustle of modern civilization, a place with bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the natural wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to another program in the Discovering Alabama series. Today we're going to float the beautiful Cahaba River. And joining us today is Mr. Bill Reeves from the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. How you doing, Bill? How you doing? We got us a warm day today. I hope you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> we might yeah. sweat a little. Bill's going to go downstream and do some fishery studies. I'm going to put in and canoe down, pick him up, and we'll travel together from that point on. So, Bill, I guess All we'll right. get you started. Okay. And I'll get started. We'll see you downstream. Okay, all right. Good enough. We'll see you down there. Come on, Turk. Let's go. Come on, boy. Come on. get out here in the sunshine, we might see a big old moccasin laying on a rock or on a branch. The Cahaba's pretty rich in wildlife. The word Cahaba is a, comes from a Choctaw word. It means water coming down from above. That's one interpretation, and it's believed to be that that name came about because the Cahaba flows from way up near Birmingham all the way down past Selma, and it comes down from higher elevation to lower elevation. Well, let's just creep along here next to the bank. And while we're creeping, take a look down there. There's a trumpet creeper blooming out over the water. Beautiful bright orange flower. Let's ease up here and get a close look at it. Got a nice, long, orange, trumpet-shaped flower on it. That's how it gets its name. There, take a gander at that. Isn't that beautiful? These are pretty common across Alabama, but they are an interesting sight, especially on a wild river like this, to see a big bunch of them hanging out over the water's edge. When the sun shines down on them, they shine a glistening bright orange. While we're here, let's take a look right up on the bank up there, too. Here's a beautiful wildflower. A bright red one called Indian pink. It's an erect perennial herb up to two and a half feet tall. It grows in kind of shady areas uh, and we need to protect it because it contains a poisonous alkaloid that uh, we might discover has a use at some point in the future. Since we're doing a program on the Cahaba River, I'd like to give a little bit of credit to a friend of mine, John Foshi, who helped popularize Alabama canoe streams. John's written a couple of books about canoeing, and this is one of his favorite haunts. So I'll throw that out for John's benefit. 
<laughs> hey turkey, here's a nice shady spot for you. I float right under this. This is a pretty sycamore tree. Nice shady spot on the riverside. Might ought to stay under that for a while and cool off some. Beautiful one. Flowing for a total river distance of more than 160 miles, the Cahaba once served as the accepted dividing line between the Choctaw and Creek Indian nations. The river's terminus at its juncture with the Alabama River near Selma was later the site of Alabama's first capital, the early town of Cahaba. Unlike so many of the state's impounded river systems, the Cahaba remains predominantly free-flowing and as a result is considered to be one of the most ecologically rich streams in the southeast. For example, 119 species of fish are known to live in the Cahaba, including species such as the gold line darter, which is found nowhere else in the state, and the Cahaba shiner, which is found nowhere else in the world. Overall, the river is home to more than 50 species of threatened and endangered animals and almost 40 species of threatened and endangered plants. We're floating up on one of the pretty shoals in the Cahaba River. These shoals are real interest in canoeing. Uh, they also are a prime habitat for a rare flower. It's a white spider lily, known as the Cahaba lily locally. It only grows in the Cahaba and another stream, West Alabama, the only two habitats of this particular lily. We'll float right down in them and take a look at them close up. Hey, let's negotiate these rocks. See if we can get right up to the lily. What do you say, Turk? Turk, you're facing the wrong way. You want to see where we've been? You're missing a nice view. There we go. Let's take a look at that lily. What about this turkey? There are several white spider lilies that grow across the country. This particular one is the Hymenocallus coronaria, and it is a rare one. Only grows here on the Cahaba and Hatchet Creek that we know of. This is a prime habitat for it. We're a little bit late for their blooming period right now, but when they're in full bloom, they'll cover this entire shoal area, and it'll just be one glaze of beautiful white. It typically has three or more flowers on the, each stem. They're fragrant, and the crown of the Cahaba lily is typically about two inches across. And it has several pointed fingers around the crown. This is really an interesting feature on the Cahaba to me. We ought to dig them up and put them in a yard, though, don't you think? <laughs> Not really. I think they're better off right where they are. These things are tough to adapt anywhere else anywhere. So let's let them enhance the Cahaba the way it is. This is where they belong. This is where they're prettiest. While we're talking about things that are in their proper place, let's take a look at the water willow while we're here on the shoals. Water willow. It's a nice plant that grows in the shoal areas. Serves an important ecological function. First of all, it's a habitat for a number of invertebrate animals, insects, etc., that the fish feed on. It also helps to build soil on the shoal areas, and that's how come we can have the beautiful lilies that we have here. And a, maybe a third thing that might relate a little more directly to you and me is these plants help take excessive nutrients out of the water. Some of the phosphates and nitrates that uh, might get into the water upstream, these kind of plants will help take those out. So they serve an important role right here on these shoals.
work, I believe I hear us the waterfall. Just up ahead. You better fasten your seatbelt. Let's see if we can pick our way through it. The water is mighty low. Hang on, Turk. We're gonna have to shoot this one pretty low. Look up there, turkey doodle. Look, stand on that rock up there. Who is that? Hello, Bad Bill. Hey, Doug. Did you have a good trip downstream? Yeah. Good. How about you? You been having a good day? Well, yeah. Seen quite a few fish. Let's see. Let me help you with that. It's a warm one. Yeah, sure is. It's a nice channel down here, Bill for doing just what you're doing. Yeah, we might be able to collect some interesting fish over there. All right, let's go take a look, see what, you, what you've done. Whoops. Well, how about that? Yeah, that's not the kind of snake I've been looking for today, but uh, it might do for a little short snake lesson. Let's see if we can All catch right. that thing before he gets out of here. Yeah, got him. Ah, come out from under that rock. That's a gray rat snake. I guess he came down off that dry hillside right out onto the rock here. Maybe hunting for uh, small critters that are moving to the water, huh? Yeah. This rat snake eats a lot of rodents and uh, frogs, things like that that he can grab. That's a healthy one. Maybe you ought to give a close-up of him there. Okay, go say hi to the viewers. Rat snake is, is non-poisonous. He's a very useful snake, helpful to mankind, uh, particularly from eating all the rodents and rats that they like to consume. But it is non-poisonous, and people really ought to make room for this snake because it's so helpful to humankind. They're typically an upland snake, though. Uh, he's just down here on the water, I imagine, today, hunting something to eat. It's a real hot, hot weather. Turk? Look here. Atta boy, Turk. Atta boy. You know what that is, don't you? Me and Turkey have both been bit. Poor snake, so he's he's leery of anything that crawls. Okay, let's see if we can turn him loose. All right. Let him go back to where he needs to be. So long, gray rat. Right, Doug, if we just kind of move this up toward the bank and kind of kick out in front of it to drive some of these smaller All right. fish into it. Hopefully we won't hang too many times. What'd you see earlier today, Bill? Well, before you got here, I did notice some gizzard shad and a two or three blacktail red horse and a freshwater drum swimming around in this little channel here. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. That'll work yes. out well. All right, Doug, these appear to be some type of shiner young of the year here. Uh, there. All right. You can tell from that one, you get a little yeah. more idea of the So you get a close up on that little shiner. Uh, coloration. Uh-huh. How important are these to the ecosystem they're, of the stream? They're very important. They not only uh, provide forage or food for larger predatory fish, but they also uh, are consumers in their own right in that they feed from uh, material that's washed down through riffle areas and that type of thing. Uh -huh. The Cahaba's pretty rich in fish species, isn't it, Bill? 
very rich. Uh, in fact, being a unique ecosystem in itself, it has at least eight species of fish that are considered either uh, <clears throat> endangered or threatened or of special concern to ecologists and fisheries people. Mm -hmm. I believe the big old Atlantic sturgeon is one of those, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't range quite this far up the river, but it's in it. Yeah, down in the lower end it tends to, uh, what, what few there have been collected in recent times been below centerville. Mm -hmm. uh, the blue sucker is another one. That's a very unique <laughs> fish, odd, odd looking fish. The Cahaba also has a, a diverse sucker population besides the blue sucker. There's a uh, black tail red horse and river red horse and uh, black red horse that inhabit the stream that form uh, very dense spawning migrations in the early spring. Uh, there's also, of those rare and endangered type species, there's at least three darters that are little bottom inhabiting fish. Uh, two shiners, two species of shiners, uh, similar to these little fellas, and uh, one species of catfish. It's a little catfish that most people wouldn't recognize because he only gets about six inches or so as a full adult. Hmm. Well, Bill, these little darters and shiners are important to the ecology of the stream. How about activity surrounding the stream? How important is that to the water quality and the ecosystem? Well, it's of course, very important, and one of the major problems that the Cahaba suffers from is siltation, not only from agricultural operations, but from mining operations. And as you can see right over there is a very tall spoil bank of a strip mine. Uh, right right up, up to the edge of the river. Yeah, right up on the edge. Bill, let's take a walk over there. I'd like a close-up look at the effects of that strip mine on the edge of the river. All right. All the way into the weeds here. Yeah. Watch out for that big gator. <laughs> hey, look over here, Bill. Beautiful wild flocks. Sure is. A nice stand of them here. This is not the particular species that is rare, but there is a rare species on the Cahaba. It's called wary flocks. Similar to this one, only the leaves are much broader. We might see some later. I'll keep my eye out. But this right. is a pretty stand here. Let's push on over to the site we're headed for okay. there. Okay. Now this is a nice yeah. spoil wash. Sure is. The whole bar was created from siltation from the strip mine. Yeah. Yeah, Doug, every bit of this is washed out of this little stream here from the strip mines up the hillside. How about that? Pretty big wash. Yeah, I imagine especially uh, during high water times it really comes down through there. We say we test the water quality and see what the pH is from that okay. strip mine. What's it read, Bill? Well, it looks like it could still use some improvement. It's uh, still not up to the standards uh, that some fish require for survival and reproduction. Okay, the water is still showing signs of having been pretty acid at one time. Yeah, huh? although it, there are signs of recovery. Okay. Doug, since this is an old strip mine, you would kind of expect the pH to moderate a little bit, although the siltation problem from upstream is still apparent from this big spoil bank that we're on. And that's still a problem the river's got to contend with, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, every year. Well, let's put in and paddle downstream and see what we can see. All right. Uh, you ready to put in, Bill? Yeah, head on downstream. Here's an interesting creature that plays a role in the stream ecology. A big dragonfly sitting there. That's a green darner, I believe. Yeah. This is also a useful creature, you know, because they eat a lot of mosquitoes, especially one that big. All right, let's get started here. Auburn man, so you're an Auburn boy, huh? Oh yeah. 
You heard any good Alabama Auburn jokes lately? Yeah, I've heard a good Alabama joke. What is it? Education. Education. That's real funny. I heard a good Auburn joke. You did? Huh? Yeah. Football. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess that makes us even then, doesn't it? I guess so. <laughs> It's a pretty stretch down through here, huh, Bill? It sure is. You get all that limestone bluff country down through there. Now, the Cahaba's interesting. It comes through three important physiographic provinces, beginning with the Cumberland Plateau further north, and then down through the Ridge and Valley province, down this part of the state, and on into the Coastal Plain province. And this limestone bluff country is down here on the edge of the Ridge and Valley province, and it's mighty beautiful. They yeah. call that the Longview limestone layer, I believe. And look coming out of the side of it right over there. That is a nice freshwater spring. All right, let's paddle in there close, Bill. All I'd right. like to have a drink of that. It looks awfully good. Looks inviting. I hope it doesn't come out of somebody's toxic dump site up on the plateau up there. <laughs> Who's got a cup? <laughs> oh, it's two. Oh. Mm. It does taste better than what comes out of the tap. But you know what? A number of health departments have advised people these days not even to drink spring water because the surface of the land has been disturbed so much that it's hard to trust even spring waters these days. Of course, you and I still got our favorite hole we drink out of, but it's wise to be to be wary. Yeah. All right, let's push on down. Okay. You know, Bill, these little side streams that come in every now and then, I get a powerful urge to want to get out and go explore all the way up them. Does that ever hit you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of them are pretty intriguing. They sure are. I spent many of my days exploring the hills and hollows of this state, but I believe I could stand to spend many more. And there's enough canoeable stream in Alabama to have one enjoyable lifetime. If I just didn't have to work for a living. <laughs> yeah. Alabama has something like 8% of the water that flows through the United States into the Gulf of Mexico that comes through Alabama. 8% of it comes through this state. That's a pretty good portion of yeah, America's. Yeah, a lot of water. Yep, sure is. And we need to do what we can to maintain the water quality and the natural conditions of our free-flowing streams, those that remain in a free-flowing condition. Now, you know, we could dam this up right here and have us a nice place for a power generator and a shopping center right over there and <laughs> this and wouldn't could, be the same. We could set up a concession stand, we'd be in business with me. Yeah. <laughs> Besides remaining free flowing, the Cahaba River and its environs have likewise managed to remain in a surprisingly good natural condition overall. This could change, however, due to expanding growth along the upper sections of the river near Birmingham and to the possibility of increasing land disturbances and pollution elsewhere in the river drainage area. Ms. Carolyn Hutchinson, as a member of the Selma Dallas County Chamber of Commerce, has helped lead a number of efforts to encourage protection for the river. We're really concerned about this river. There are about 30,000 people who live in the Cahaba River Basin. And when we get things from the urban areas upstream like strip mine pollution, sewage, pollution from clear cutting, industrial spills, it ruins the fishing for everybody, it ruins the river for everybody. 
The three county commissions have been so concerned that they actually passed resolutions establishing a Senate corridor for the Cahaba River. We all want the river to remain in its natural state for the future generations. Similar concerns are shared by Joe Broadwater, director of the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. The Department of Environmental Management is the principal permitting agency in the state for all discharges into the state waters. And the Cahaba River, of course, is one of these state waters, and it is in a corridor that is experiencing a tremendous amount of demand as far as development is concerned, and it's one of the major problems in the state of Alabama today. The problems in the Cahaba River will not be solved solely by government, by a permitting entity, nor will it be solved strictly by the developers or the Jefferson County or the city of Birmingham. It is going to require a cooperative, coordinated effort on all of our part in order to be able to deal with the situation that we have on the Cahaba River where it is providing a source of drinking water, also a means of sewage disposal. And we look forward to working with all of the concerned parties in solving this problem over the next few years. Well, we had a good time today, Bill. Water was a little low, but we had a good time. Tree. I'd like to give one quick word of caution to the viewers. Canoeing can be tricky, especially on swollen streams and sometimes on low streams. Be sure you know what you're doing before you get out there. If you have any comments you'd like to let us know what you think about the show, please send them to Discovering Alabama. Until we meet again, keep your river rolling. The preceding program was funded in part by a grant from Barbara Dairies, a producer of milk and ice cream products since 1931.